Hello everyone, I'm now doing a vodcast on the very basics of chemostat kinetics using this absolutely amazing diagram I've just drawn you of a continuous culture bioreactor. Now, I know this is an area a lot of you do feel quite intimidated by because there's maths and horrible equations and you don't quite understand the whys and wherefores. The other problem we have, of course, as you know, is that the majority of textbooks that are dedicated to this subject are A, quite old, and B, very dry. So I'm going to try and explain it visually with a few scribblings here. And what I've drawn for you is a very basic um, bioreactor. And I'm going to be drawing this with... Um, I'm going to be indicating it, sorry, with my lightsaber, as that's already quite popular. Now, we have here medium and it's going into a vessel, and that vessel contains a volume of culture. It starts with medium, obviously you inoculate it, it becomes a culture. And the volume is V, and that is always measured in litres. We have medium flowing out of the reactor again, and in this particular setup that I've drawn, air goes in at the top, it bubbles up through the liquid, and it leaves with the medium. Now there's all sorts of different setups in practice. Some of them the medium leaves through the top with a pump. Some of them it leaves through a hole in the bottom and it's done by gravity. This one is just one of many possible examples. Now, the rate that that medium exits, important, not enters, exits the vessel, is F. And F is measured in litres per hour or litres per minute. It's not really that important. Now what can we do with those values? Well, we can start with some very basic calculations. So we've got volume V and that was in litres and we've also got our flow rate which we're going to put in litres per hour. In reality you probably measure it in mils per minute and then you multiply it back up. From these two, we can calculate a very useful parameter, D, which is equal to F over V. Now, D is your dilution rate. And it's essentially a measure of how many times the total volume of medium in the reactor at any point in time gets replaced. Okay, so if D equals 1, reciprocal hour, it's measured in reciprocal hours, if D was equal to 1 reciprocal hour, that's the other way of writing it, slash H, if D was 1 reciprocal hour, that would tell you that it was replaced once per hour. If it was 0.5, it would tell you it's replaced half a time per hour, or once every two hours. Now, in terms of the actual microbiology, well, D, at steady state, is exactly equal to mu, which is the specific growth rate. So, given that we tell the chemostat what this value is, because we set the flow rate on the pump, because we set the flow rate on the pump and we know the volume of the, re of the medium because we set it in the first place, we can tell really very easily the reactor that we want a specific value of mu. And this has got all sorts of wonderful applications. If we want to grow an organism at the same temperature, and change the growth rate, we can do that, or keep the growth rate exactly the same and change all sorts of other parameters, we can do that too. It's the only way you can grow a culture with a defined growth rate. It is not possible any other way. So, what can we do with those data? How do we manipulate them and how do we make them useful? Well, what we can do is a series of different plots, and the most common way of calculating kinetic parameters from the chemostat is to draw what is known as the double reciprocal plot, which looks like this. And in the double reciprocal plot, which is analogous to the line weaver burke plot, we have to calculate another parameter first, y. And I'm going to come on to what y is in just a moment and how we calculate it. And a double reciprocal plot looks like that. Now, I'm going to jump forward slightly and I'm going to tell you um, what y is and then I'm going to come back. y is the yield what is yield. If we take a culture and we measure how much biomass we've produced, whether that is in terms of uh, how many cells there are per litre or how many milligrams of dry biomass there are per litre, personally I prefer the second 
because obviously if you've got a culture of an organism with very small cells, you could have twice the number of cells, but it's the same amount of biomass in terms of how much carbon there is. So I tend to use biomass. Now, that amount of biomass in a litre, or amount of biomass in general, is X. X is amount of biomass. And X is not really very useful. Oh, I can't write. This is terrible. Let me rub that out. It's amount of biomass. I'm not going to bother writing it properly. This is a vodcast. It doesn't have to be perfect. There we go. Now, that isn't a very useful parameter on its own, because we can't really do an awful lot with this on its own. It's all very well knowing how much biomass was produced, but obviously the amount of substrate actually degraded is really rather important. So what happens in the chemostat when we reach our steady state is this. The amount of substrate measurable in the actual vessel is zero, completely zero. So we define that. That's how we know it's a steady state because there's no substrate left. So if we made our medium over here, and that's what gets fed into the reactor itself and then flows back out. We know at steady state concentration of, um, let's say we're using xylose as our carbon source, is obviously zero at steady state. That is absolute and we have to measure that and check it. Here in the medium that we've made, let's say that it's 10 millimolar. Now, we do a few calculations based on this. We can tell from that that if you take the initial concentration of substrate, which we usually abbreviate like so, and that was 10 millimolar, and the concentration at steady state, which is the final concentration of substrate, is 0 millimolar, and we take one away from the other, that tells us that 10 millimolar was consumed. Now, if V, in our example, was equal to 400 millilitres, we've obviously got less than this value in terms of actual amount. So we've got 10 millimoles per litre, that's what this means, but we haven't got a litre, we've got 400 millilitres here. So we have to make it so that it's a bit more normalised. So first of all, if we take the fact that V equals 0.4 litres, and substrate consumed, which I'm going to abbreviate as xylose consumed, was 10 millimolar, which is 10 millimoles per litre, and we've got that, we know that the amount actually, the actual amount of xylose that was consumed is 0.4 times the 10 millimoles that were present in the litre. That gives us 4 millimoles of xylose used in a 0.4 litre steady state culture. Now let's say, for example, that in if you measured the amount of biomass present in that culture at that point, let's say there was 200 mg per litre dry biomass. Okay, that's X. If you wanted to get yield, what you have to do is normalise this to this as follows. So we've got X equal to 200 mg per litre. So we normalise that in the same way as we normalised before, because our volume, of course, is 0.4 litres. So we do 0.4 multiplied by this, which is 80 mg per litre. Oops, sorry, no. 80 milligrams. Okay, so 80 milligrams of biomass were produced, and it's 80 milligrams per 4 millimoles of xylose. Therefore, the yield 
is equal to 80 over 4, which is 20. 20 watt. What are the units? Well, we've got milligrams on the top, of course, and we've got millimole on the bottom. Therefore, we have 20... 20 mg per dry biomass per millimole of xylose. Now that is our yield. Now let's go back to the graph that I drew a little while ago, the double reciprocal plot. In this we put 1 over the yield and we put 1 over dilution rate, which is equal to 1 over maximum specific growth rate. If we plot our data on there by growing lots of chemostats at different values of D, we would get something that looked vaguely like this. Okay, And we would draw a line through it like so. And then how do we use it? Well, down here is a very useful value, which is 1 over Y max. Now, Y max can be written like that, or it can be written like that. In print, you tend to see this. In rough notes, you tend to see this. This, for maximum, is a little bit old-fashioned these days, even for my standards, but it's easy to write on these screens. The second value we get comes from the gradient, which is something known as MS, and we'll come on to that in a moment. We'll first do this one. We'll consider this first, and then we'll consider this second. It's a very easy plot to draw. What gets difficult is we do all the different bits so oops wrong tool let me go here we go so maximum yield what that is is a theoretical maximum yield it's not a real value you can't actually measure it why do we do it well if you were to go back to that previous slide and look at the graph and you were to grow two organisms and let's say you wanted to compare their yields on xylos, just as we've kind of calculated, and you grow organism 1, and organism 1 only grows at very low growth rates, so all the data are up here, can't grow at high growth rates. Organism 2 can only grow at high growth rates. Now the problem is we can't really compare those data, and I'm just going to make that a little bit more clear, because that's not a very good example. So there's our organism 2 growing at its high growth rates. If we were to draw the line through that one, and we were to draw the line through that one, that would allow us to calculate a maximum for each one, and we note that they're different. And because they're different, we're able to compare those two organisms by virtue of this kind of theoretical parameter that doesn't exist in the wild. Because what we can't do, because it wouldn't be fair, is to compare these data gathered at low rates and these data gathered at high rates because it's apples and oranges. But if we normalise them into this value up here, we finally got something we can actually use. So that is why we use Y with a hat, Y max. It's a theoretical value, and it simply allows us to basically compare apples and oranges by making them into something a little bit more tangible. I'm going to just talk briefly about the last parameter which is the gradient of that line on that wonderful, useful graph. And that was MS. Now, that is the maintenance coefficient, and I can never spell maintenance. Maintenance. Coefficient. Oh, well, you know what I mean, maintenance coefficient. Why do we use maintenance coefficient? It tells us... Lots of different things. There's a lot of debate in the literature about the exact most valuable, useful way of defining microbial maintenance. And it is quite simply this. Maintenance coefficient tells us, in our example, how much xylose just to stay alive. How many xylose do we need just to tick over? Not growth, not reproduction in any way, just staying alive, maintaining the cell, repair, or whatever. Very well. If we had our culture and we calculated, okay, here's our plot that we're used to now. Okay, there are our data 
from growing our organism on xylose alone. Now let's say we were to vary the um, conditions by growing at the same rates, same amount of xylose, exactly the same organism, but in our example we're going to add uranium to the culture, which is quite a toxic metal. We may see this graph change this shape. What does that tell us? It tells us that when you add uranium, MS increases. Why? Well, cost of staying alive has gone up. It's kind of like living through a hurricane. You're going to start spending more money maintaining your house. This is assuming you're living through a 24-7 hurricane, which, to be honest, in the southwest of England right now, in February 2014, it does feel a little bit like that's the case. But what we're doing is we're having to spend all our money maintaining the building, and we don't get to do anything fun with it, like reproduce. So the bacteria are spending all their ATP and all their reducing equivalents on staying alive, and they can't actually grow because they have to prioritise staying alive over growth. That is always the case in the bacteria. So a high ma maintenance coefficient indicates the cost of living has gone up if you're looking at the same organism. If you're comparing two different organisms, it tells you a lot about their growth efficiency. If two organisms are both grown on xylose, two different organisms, and one of them's got a maintenance coefficient like this, and one has a maintenance coefficient that comes from a graph like this, i.e. the red one's higher and the green one's lower, what does that tell us? It tells us that the red one is less efficient and the green one is more efficient at growing on xylose. That's really all there is to it. Now this is getting a bit long, so I'm going to draw it to a close now. This is just to give you the basics that I gave you all in the lectures for microbial life, and I'm hoping that you can use this just to go back over some of those points that I made, because I know some of you are struggling. Okay, goodbye.